Imagine the ocean is full of dolphins and Prophet is a new kind of shark that looks just like a dolphin. He could maneuver among the dolphins. The other dolphins would say, welcome, and dolphin talk. And then he'd, you know, one night start eating them. <laughs> Wait to remain silent. If you give up that right ending, you say you can't, and will be used against you in court of law. I don't see him as an amoral or immoral individual. I think he had a superior set of moral values that um, enabled him to act with relative impunity. God bless this wonderful country of ours. He was sexy and he was dangerous. He was dusky and dark. He's not a mustache twirling villain. He never thinks he's smart or that he's clever. He, in fact, would like you to be his friend if at all possible. If not, he'll kill you. The game we played in the writer's room was always what's the worst thing he could do and then try to double it. I went to NYU um, and uh, mostly wrote screenplays in the 80s. I uh, wrote for Disney and Paramount and Fox and, and Interscope and then uh, really kind of stumbled into television. Um, there was no real design to it. I, I had become friends with uh, David Greenwald, who's the co-creator of Profit. We did a couple movie projects together. We did a TV movie together for Disney, for ABC, and became friends. In the late 80s, I began to sort of dabble in television. I was still a big snob about television, but then I realized this is a writer's medium, is television. I became very interested in television, and I did some Wonder Years. I did a Doogie Howser. He just kept calling me and saying, it's really great television because they don't have time to change your scripts. You write it and they have to sort of shoot it. I went to work for Mr. Stephen J. Cannell. So many people in this town learn to write television in the Cannell uh, studio. In television, usually there's a network in a studio. and They might be the same entity, they might be two different entities, but you always have two entities. But Stephen J. Cannell was his own studio. So I literally go over to David's office and just watch him and Stephen and the guys. I think he wrote, a show, wrote for a show called The Hat Squad and then he wrote for The Commish. And it was while he was on The Commish that he and I came up with the idea for profit. My good friend John McNamara, he was very young then, he was in his 20s, and he walks into my office. I instantly liked this guy, this mean, plucky, cocky little Irishman with a great sense of humor and a great writer. David is one of the smartest people I know, forget in television. Um, he's just one of the smartest people I know. He's, he's an accomplished musician. He's a really, really fine writer, obviously. He's a, an amazing director, um, which I am not, you know. So it, it, we kind of complement each other in a weird way. A lot of his strengths are my weaknesses and, 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 vice, and vice versa. We knew we wanted to do a show together, and we knew we wanted to do a show with a villain at the center. There was a national tour of Richard III with Ian McKellen, and it was done in modern dress. I went to see it. And I called David and I said, you know, this was like, it was written yesterday. I mean, it's so amazing. And, and, and I've forgotten that Richard III not only talks to the audience, he tells them what he's going to do, and then he does it. And it, that sounds like it's going to be very boring, but in fact, you're sort of saying, here's the perfect plan. And then you're watching the plan go slightly awry. And then you're saying, oh my God, how is he going to get out of it? And that structure somehow bonds you to that character and you become, when you watch a good production of Richard III, you kind of become Richard III and you realize, oh my God, I'm pulling for a psychopath. I grew up in the hotel business. And my father owned tiny little hotels where we all worked as a family. But you know, Conrad Hilton was up the street. So I was aware of that kind of corporate stuff and I'm interested in that. I remember one of us said, you know, there hasn't been a really good corporate drama. Dynasty had sort of run its course. Dallas had sort of run its course. It was the early 90s. So we started researching you know, corporations. And the first thing we sort of thought of, you know, if you were really successful and you didn't get caught, probably a corporation would let you get away with anything. Corporations, by their nature, don't care about right and wrong or legal and illegal. They only care about profit, hence the title. I think it's very easy to watch the show and go, well, obviously corporations are bad. And I'm here as David Greenwald to tell you, I think corporations are good. I think capitalism is great. But, you know, they can become rapacious and get out of control because nothing is perfect. The series view of corporations was not 
a negative one. It was not intended to be negative. And it was sort of, for me, a throwback to the man in the gray flannel suit. There was a time in the 50s and 60s when people kind of looked up to companies and they expected a certain level of human being to be in those companies and running those companies. What would happen if someone with, you know, no heart and no soul were, were dropped into that place? Someone who simply was a, a pure predator. You know, I can't say enough about Stephen Cannell. But just to have his support, to have him be behind the show, willing to put his name, his imprimatur on, on the show, was marvelous. And he really just put us in the boat and let us, you know, go down the rapids ourselves. They came to me one day with this, with this thing pretty well developed. I mean, of all the shows that I produced out of my company, this is the one I probably had the least to do with. The president of his company was a guy named Kim LaMasters, who had been the president of CBS. And David and Kim were friendly. And David pitched him the one line in the hallway. I forget how he even did it. He just he just cornered him in the hallway and said, basically something along the lines of Richard III for television. You know, he's smart, he's successful, he's young, he's handsome, he's a psychopath, and only the audience knows. Kim optioned it on the spot. We then got together, created an elaborate pitch, um, pitched it to Stephen, who loved it, said go. We went out with his blessing and his company name. We went to CBS. We were literally kicked out of CBS. We got to, he kisses the woman in his office deeply and then says, hi, mom. And this executive, who shall remain nameless, uh, this executive said, that, that guy's the hero of the show? And we said, yeah. And he said, OK, you're done. And David and I said, what? And he said, you can leave now. He literally said, get the heck out of my office. We thought that was hilarious. I mean, we were not, it didn't throw us at all. We thought that made, that, that meant we were on the right track. Kim Masters, to his great credit, fell in love with this idea and just would not let it go. His passion was unabated for two years of development, which is kind of unheard of. TV pilots, when they're written, they either go or they don't go. And when they don't go, they die. I can't say enough about Kim Masters and how he shepherded this project. We eventually went to Fox, which was sort of cutting edge, and they, shockingly, they bought the idea. Through Stephen and Kim, we found that executive at Fox. His name was Bob Greenblatt. We pitched him on, I believe it was November 1st, 1992. And I remember it because pitch season was had been over for about three weeks. We, we, we couldn't sell this thing. We couldn't get meetings. You know, neither one of us were showrunners. Um, and Bob sort of saw us, I think, just out of the kindness of his heart, as a pity pitch. The pitch took 45 minutes. It was the entire pilot, and then some. The next day, it was election day. It's the day, you know, Clinton was elected. And I remember getting the phone call from David watching the return, you know, watching the news about Clinton. And David said they bought it. We had about six hours. You know, this character was so rich. To us, he was so interesting. And Greenblatt wisely said, make a two-hour pilot, don't make a, a one-hour pilot. We were both pretty happy with the script. Stephen had a lot of input. He got it. He went into his office. He locked the door, said no phone calls. We were just so nervous. And I was just, I mean, the guy who created the Rockford Files was like reading the script. And he had been really nice to me. He came out, you know, and Stephen's a big, he's a big guy of commanding presence. And you're in a building with his name on it already. So like you're sitting under Cannell, and out comes Cannell. And he's got the script in his hand. It was a big, thick, you know, it was a two-hour script. And he said, guys, I feel like I've been sitting in my office with a cobra on my desk. Go make it. <laughs> These guys fashioned a really unique and really interesting hour of television. We couldn't believe anybody had been interested, Kim Masters and Stephen Cannell. We couldn't believe Fox had bought it. We were sure it wouldn't get made because it was just seemed too strange. Within days of that fantastic compliment from Stephen, there was a regime change at Fox. The new regime didn't like the script. Uh, they thought it was kind of dark. <laughs> you think, yeah, really? You think, what? Profit? Um, and we both went on to do other things. A year goes by. Now we're in the second year of this thing. You, the, in television, that's a dead project. I'm on Lois and Clark. I'm a, I'm a supervising producer on Lois and Clark. I'm happy as a clam writing Superman, and I get a call that there's been another regime change at Fox. 
John Matoyan takes over Fox. John Matoyan walks into his office the first day. Kimmel Masters is there waiting with the script in hand saying, you say you want to make edgy stuff, you say you want to make something different, here it is. And an hour later, he greenlit the project. And I think just because he was so sick of people calling him and bugging him, he said, fine, make the damn thing. If you can find a guy to play profit, we'll make it. To cast Jim Prophet was really a hard thing. We tested, I think, literally every actor in Hollywood and New York between the ages of 28 and 35. I mean, everybody came in and read for this thing. And we couldn't find him, and the, and the network was getting edgy, and, you know, time was ticking away. And I hadn't found anybody who could balance the threat with the humor. David went to New York, and he came back. He said, I met a couple guys who were good, and one of them we're going we're gonna to do a film test with. But this one other guy... I really, I really liked him, but he won't read for the part. I said, who is he? He said, it's Adrian Pazdar. I said, from Top Gun? So my first impression was, well, this is a great looking guy, and I get that he could carry this, but I'll bet you he's not funny. I'll bet you he's one of these bicep, camel smoking, you know, serious New York actors. I'm going to be stuck with a lunk. I'd met with David Greenwald. They wanted to have an audition, and I said, look, I don't really, if I read for this character, uh, there's no way I'll get it. I just knew that. You know, it's one of those things where you have to have the whole pie, not just a piece, in order to get the flavor of what the, the character is. He said, you can't read for this part. You just got to do it. You can't get everything you want in a room full of executives holding a script in your hand. It, it just it won't, it won't, trust me, it will not work. And I thought this guy is either unbelievably full of shit or he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And luckily the latter turned out to, to, be, to be the case. Adrian was really smart. And the network was like, we love him, we'll make it with him. And I said, okay, let's go. And by God, he turned out to be the nicest, sweetest guy ever born. You know, now it's 1995, by the way. We've now moved into another year. Thank God we found other jobs because he couldn't live off of profit. It was, it was not profitable to work on profit. I think the pilot is, objectively, I can look at it now 10 years later and just say that was just really good. And I, a lot of that is, is Rob Isco. He just directed it perfectly. Rob had a lot to do with, you know, setting the visual style of the show. It's very contrasty, very edgy in its look, the way it was shot, off-center framing, all of that. The pilot, I, I, I thought, was so well executed uh, on so many levels. She's a vegetarian, Joanne. With that lifestyle, I sure hope you're getting enough protein. Rob knew exactly how to get the right tone so that it was crisp but not arch. That was crucial because if you played it too naturalistically, it'd be flat. If you played it too arch, it would be, you know, seem like a high school play. It's kind of difficult to get anything decent without meeting it. Oh, you're a vegetarian? Try. First day of dailies, network hated them. I mean, hated the dailies. Adrian's hair scared them because it was so slick and so high. And the first day of daily scared them because Adrian, you know, was really breathy and really dark. Any kind of life is better than the alternative. And they thought, oh, he's too scary, he's too scary, you know. We're like, he's a psychopath. He's gonna have sex with his mom and kill his dad. Well, you can't expect everyone to like you. You know, Adrian was great. Adrian said, if, if they didn't hate the first day of dailies, I'd think we were doing something wrong. Again, very smart. To have Steve as a guy you could call and, and say, Steve, they hated the dailies. He goes, don't worry about it. He called Rob Iscove, who he worked with before, and Rob just slightly adjusted Adrian's performance, so he showed a slightly warmer, nicer side. I'm still trying to find my parking space in the morning. It was very important to me uh, that the guy who played Prophet have a sense of humor, and thank God it turns, it turns out that Adrian, he had a great sense of humor about himself. I can't believe we're doing this. Oh, we're doing this. Trust me. The green suit is an example of Adrian's puckish side. It was St. Patrick's Day in reality when we shot that scene. And he just thought it would be really funny to wear a green suit on St. Patrick's Day. I love the music in the pilot. I think it's delicate, it's creepy, it's smart. Mike was one of Steve's oldest friends. And because of Steve, we got him. I mean, you didn't get Mike Post to do a pilot. For, I mean, basically for free, I think. Before the show was picked up, there's no money for a, for, a, for a composer. Mike loved the script, and he he said, Steve gave me the script, I'll, I, I'll do anything. 
I'll do whatever you want. And he was instrumental in finding the right tone. We then started testing. Horrible testing. Horrible testing. Unbelievable how low the show tested. We turned to Steve, you know, what do we do? He goes, you know, there's like one scene they really seem to hate when he's actually in bed with his mom, post-coitally. Let's take that scene out. I said, and then what? He goes, nothing, lock it. And nothing changed after that. We didn't change a frame. Steve said, lock it, you locked it. There were two kind of core anchors to the pilot. One was the end of Act One. We knew he was going to kiss this gorgeous, slightly older woman and say, Hi, Mom. And the other was that he was going to have to find and kill his father. Do I know you? I did. I don't think anybody had seen anything like that on television ever. What are we doing here? I told you, Dad. You're going home. We went to a place that I think was sort of primal and certainly has been dealt with a lot in Greek tragedy and in Shakespeare. We don't show him actually putting the needle in the father's arm, but it's very clear what he's doing. And as he looks back at his dead father, he feels some weird thing in his eye and he looks and realizes it's a tear. And he just looks at it like, what is that? And, and moves right on. And that is profit in a nutshell is what that is. It's like, I am a human being, but I'm really not a human being. And that's, I will always be outside of society and mores and life. When two people fall out of love and into hate, they become vulnerable to all manner of passions, fears, and if someone's watching carefully, manipulation. I think that Jim Prophet is a step out of phase with life, and that's both his greatest strength and his greatest weakness. In a case like this one, you just know somebody's bound to wind up dead. He has no moralities. He doesn't seem moral or immoral. They just, they aren't, his, they aren't on his radar screen. Jim Prophet's emotions are pretty measured and muted, I would say. He, he can mimic any emotion perfectly. Let it all out, huh? There's no emotion he can't convince you of. I'm sorry. Don't be. Crying, laughing, happiness, joy. But there are very few moments in the show where he's having an authentic emotional experience. I think uh, less is clearly more in a situation like this all the way around. I feel just like Cinderella. Hmm. That's the key to a, a character uh, that has a lot going on but can't, can't explain or, or convey it physically. He's an interesting character because he respects authority and he loves order. He really, really believes in order over happiness. He believes in duty over freedom. He believes in service over anything. I'm not bringing someone from the outside to take Pete's job. I'm giving it to you. He does not want to become CEO. He does not want to become president. I'm afraid I can't accept it. I'm afraid I don't understand you, Jim. He does not want to be in the light. He wants to be back here humbly serving, but in serving, he wants really everyone to do what he says. Use that. Bring him back into the fold. He is very much an Iago character. He's very much in the shadows, very much the power behind the throne. If the show had stayed on five or 10 years, he would never have been the CEO of Grayson and Grayson. He would always be the guy in the shadows. He does not want to be stage center. He doesn't want the spotlight. And make sure he doesn't get home before nine o'clock tonight. He wants control. And, and that goes right back to his childhood. This was a child that was, you know, as a child, he was horribly abused. And, and, and I think most importantly, he was ignored. Literally to put him in a box with a little cutout and then to put a TV in the cutout is to say to a child, you're worthless. You are meaningless. You are not worth the time and effort to love or to hate. Adrian was unbelievable, you know? I mean, he, he was the show. Adrian always walked like a boxer. He always walked with his shoulders kind of moving and legs close together, like he was about ready to either hit you or get hit. And I thought all of that made him seem like a guy who had really fought his way up from, from, from nothing. You'll have to teach me how you develop such a clear mind. Oh, I spent years living in a box. None of that was in the script. And a lot of that is just what Adrian brings. You should try it. 
it's flattering, but I didn't have um, a whole lot to do uh, with how brilliant Jim Prophet was. Got to make the rumors work for us, Jazz. It drives the stock up. And in fact, this morning, I think you made just over three and a half million dollars. It was like driving a Porsche. Sure, you can be a good driver, but at a certain point, the vehicle is going to decide whether or not you win the race. So you take her downstairs into the basement where the soda pop is kept. His intensity was wonderful to play off of, I'll put it that way. You know, he gave a lot. Adrian Pasdar just played the living shit out of this guy because Adrian is having so much fun up there. The writing was just so brilliant between him and John that there's almost no way you could mess it up. Adrian was unbelievably detail-oriented. The wardrobe is always perfect. You know, he's chosen exactly the right tie, the right belt, the right ring. What I wanted to do with uh, Profit with gloves was, aside from the simple phobia of not wanting to leave, uh, getting germs and not wanting to leave fingerprints, there's something freeing. Like when a soldier puts on a uniform, you need a buffering between you and the world that you're dealing with sometimes to make it easier to deal with that world. Adrian has a really good work ethic. He just comes to the set very prepared, and you don't see the preparation. He doesn't say, call me Jim for the rest of the day. He doesn't burden you with some bullshit accent. He just does what's right for the character. And I was so lucky because there's two people who set the tone on a set. One is me, the executive producer, and one is the star. Is your star um, a good person? Is he on time? Is he considerate of other people? Is he well prepared? Is he professional? You know, is he calm in a crisis? And Adrian was all of those things. Adrian Pazdar set the tone for a really wonderful experience for me and I think everybody involved. I think he made the guest stars feel comfortable and secure and he certainly made us feel that way too. Should I be jealous? It's my mother. There was always something about Adrian that, that made you want to kind of root for him even though you know you shouldn't. Adrian channeled something like really got it, really got the humor and really got the, the, um, the threat. How about one last time? John and David really had a finger on the pulse of what the guy was about. How much fun it would be to play the darker side of human nature. Should I take that as a no? David's view of profit was, I think, in some ways, a lot more humane than mine, maybe less judgmental. I come by every so often just to see how she's doing. I actually somehow could never get away from the idea that he was evil. Why is her bed? I moved it closer to the window. I thought it might be nicer for her. David really just sought out that which was recognizable about, about him as a person. I was just interested in what he did to people and then the effect he had on other people. So my episodes were always about his effect on quote unquote normal people. And this. What is that? I wasn't as interested or maybe as adept at David, as, as David was, at, at getting deep inside the character. He actually does a lot of things for other people. And sometimes they have good results and sometimes they have bad results. And he's very good at using other people and working through other people. In a sense, he's a corporate uh, rah-rah guy because he's good at inspiring. I want what's best for the company. Firing a Grayson is always bad publicity, Chaz. I really think that should only be undertaken in the most extreme circumstances. Trying to mount a hostile takeover and steal my job. In my book, that's pretty extreme. Following on Adrian's heels, we got this just incredible cast. Every single person, uh, there was not one weak link in the entire chain. The three Lisas. Lisa Dar, Lisa Zane, and Lisa Blunt. I just thought they were amazing. Very different actresses, very different personalities, very different roles. I had just come off another doomed, brilliant series, you know, that was fated to be thrown off the air called Middle Ages. And so there was a lot of interest in me at the time for series. And so, um, you know, it happened fairly easily. I auditioned a few times, got it. I was very pleased. <laughs> the role didn't have a lot of humor on the page. I think, I think it, it, was, it was fairly straight. And what I love about Zane is, is um, she didn't change it. She just gave everything a certain topspin. Wow, he's really upset. Which she has in life. She's a very charismatic, fun, lively person. I like the way it read. It was very fast reading, although very dense at the same time. And it was um, intelligent. It credited the audience with a lot of intelligence. One of the most difficult things in Prophet, he's like a superhero, is finding a good foil for him. He's so smart, he's so ahead of everything. I'd like to think that someday, despite all this, we might be friends, huh? Sure. If you ever got a soul, 
or I got a lobotomy. There's no doubt about it. She's formidable. Joanne Meltzer comes from a very abusive background like Prophet. So she's like, you don't fool me. I know what you're up to. I see through you. And guess what, pal? I had ugly things happen to me, and I made a choice for the better. So that's why they were good foils. Joanne. You can open this door, and you're going to give me the name of that partner. Oh, please, Jim, break down the door. Give me an excuse to blow your psychopathic head off. She sees the psychopath in him. She knows it because she's looked down the barrel. And so she knows, but no one believes her. And so she's really alone. Well, one thing that she has as a person and on screen is unbelievable strength. You know, there's a moment in the pilot where he's facing off with her at the end. And he says, you can't run from your past. And she leans into him. She almost, she almost looks like, like the alien. And you can't run from me, son of a bitch. She brought so much pain to it. You felt that pain in everything she did, but she never wore it on her sleeve. We're an odd pair, especially because also we're male and female, so all the psychological tensions and layers are at play all the time, but kept in check. Do I tell him that Ivan Karpov is going to kill you for betraying him, or do I wait for the next letter, you know, sort of spread out the good news? Whichever one you choose, make sure you give them my best. We're both, you know, different sides of the same coin. In all great stories, the sheriff is just as driven and dark as the outlaw. They sort of checkmate each other. And um, I think Prophet really likes Joanne. And I think on some level he's confused and maybe even a little hurt by the fact that she just won't come around. If we had gone a full season or the end of the second season, or at the beginning of the, the, the second season, we might have blown up Joanne Meltzer, uh, uh, Lisa Zane, a worthy foil for profit, just to, to keep people on, on edge. <laughs> Jim Prophet had a very interesting relationship with his stepmother. And the pitch that got us kicked out of CBS, it was his mother. It was not his stepmother. In fact, we even joked that, like, if we make it a stepmother, we're just punks, and that'd be like, you know, that's what they do on TV, you know, we're cooler than that. And, of course, I think one of the first notes from Fox was when they bought it, um, can we make it a stepmom? We're like, yep, sure, no problem, <laughs> because we just couldn't believe they bought it. I auditioned for the creative team of Profit, I believe, for the role that Lisa Dar ended up playing. And I can't remember who it was that said, well, let's just see uh, if she were to read for the uh, role of Jim's stepmother. I said, OK, this should be pretty easy. And it was, and, and I got that, that role. Did you call this mugger from any phone traceable to you? No, I ain't stupid. Oh, well, that's a relief. She proved to be a very unsettling factor in his life from a very early age. And uh, I think he never quite got over her. Um, she might have been his first love, his only love. What's it gonna be? Oh, Jimmy. I just love it when you get surly. <laughs> she brought so much sexuality and so much intelligence and cunning. I just think she's one of the best actresses out there. You don't mind me changing like this, do you? I mean, I just think of you as family. One of the things you fear as a writer is the actor calling you on the phone with questions, comments, or corrections on their fucking dialogue. But Lisa would call, and Lisa was a real Southern gal, too, um, and she could certainly channel this character. And she, she said, you know, I think I can do it in less words. And she would give me an idea, and they were always brilliant. They allowed me to have a little bit of say-so in, in my part. And I've worked for so many... Uh, you know, especially in television, creators who will not allow you to change one word. It's just not done, and stop asking. And these guys would were very interested in my input. A lot of her dialogue that you're hearing is, you know, some big clunky thing of mine that's been boiled down to just the simplest thing. Bobby, when are you going to learn to trust me? Uh, about never. The dialogue between Bobby and Jim had an absolute comedic rhythm that you just couldn't miss. If you just stood up and said your lines, it would be very funny. It's dreamy! She was fearless. That was the best part about it. You couldn't have an actress in there who had any trepidation or reservation about committing herself to that role. 
she got to be loud, brassy, and scream, and wear stilettos. That's a lot of fun at a certain point in your life. Ooh, how did I get so lucky? It's fun to be that sexual and that, you know, ridiculous. She was a loose cannon, all right. I'm behind the wheel of this new automobile, and I'm high as a kite. Pull over. That scene where she's driving in a car talking on the phone <laughs> and forgiveness is... It's just it's still one of my favorite things David's ever written. I'm happy. See, that's what worries me about you. You don't feel nothing. And forgiveness, she's crashed this car and she's in the hospital. And he comes in there and he has what I thought was a pretty great speech where, you know, she wants him to fix this, get rid of the records. She knows he has the power and control to put things right. And he just throws a pitcher of water on her and she says, listen to me, Bobby. This is America, Bobby. Where even a drug-guzzling gutter slut like you can be the sole emotional support of a man like Charles Grayson. Now you have a decision. Either you're gonna marry him and help me control the fourth largest concentration of power and wealth in this country, or you're gonna die with a needle in your veins. It's your choice. The thing about Adrian, you know, he has a great sense of humor. I really felt that we were a very well-matched team and that we could go a little bit farther together because I was so comfortable with him. If you want to play this game along, fine. Just better be prepared to lose. You play better tennis when you play with good tennis players, obviously, and she was terrific. Hey. You got time for a quickie? Johnny and I used to talk a lot, like, does he enjoy fucking the stepmom? Is it just a duty to him? And I, frankly, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. You have to ask Jim Prophet about that. You can't scare me anymore. I'm not trying to scare you, Gail. Lisa Dar as Gail Conner. I think we probably had more, as much trouble casting that role as casting Jim Prophet. <laughs> because there was a lot of comedy implied in the character, but it's not like laugh out loud funny, and a lot of it is terrifying. I did say that it was Mr. Prophet, but he didn't have anything to do with it. We noticed that when actors would do it and they would play the melodrama, it was cringingly awful. When they would underplay, it was it was flat. Lisa Dar brought this slight sense of Mrs. Greer. Yes. Mary Graveman, IRS. Of Lucille Ball. Like, here she is trapped. You know I'd never force you to do anything. She likes this guy, but she's terrified of him. And she kind of wants what he has to offer, but she's really afraid of the price she'll have to pay. And she's very, very aware that what he's doing is wrong, but very aware of the fact that it sort of feels good. I've made sure that the 25th floor conference room is booked, so you'll have to meet with Chaz on the 18th, right around the corner from Joanne's office. Good work. One of my favorite characters in the show, and one of my favorite people and actors, too. Hey, Gail, see you in? Uh, no. I just set these on his desk. Mr. Grayson, I'm sorry. He doesn't like anyone in there when he's not around. My favorite stuff she would do is, is she'd just be in, in some situation you know, of, of incredible intensity, and she's about to, you know, the, the plan is almost gonna happen, and the phone would ring, and she'd just jump. Lisa, to me, was us, the audience, because she's always like, uh, what's he gonna do next? Can I trust him? Can I not? I can't stress enough how much you need that in a show like this. It's the relief. You gotta have that. She made it fun. I mean, she really did. We always wanted to do the Gale episode. It was on the board from day one. In business, the easiest thing to forget is someone's feet. Gail applied for a promotion two weeks ago. It was denied due to her quote-unquote lack of experience in senior management. She wants to move up in the corporation, but she has not been recognized by her quote-unquote betters. And more importantly, she hasn't taken the impetus. She hasn't, you know, taken the bull by the horns. And he takes her into Charles Grayson's office and sits her in the big chair. And... Mm -hmm. I believe in you. And I believe you have a great future with this organization. So he's kind of helping her, and at the same time, he's totally using her. And I tell you, I have plans for you. You believe that too, right? I want to. And he sends her back to deal with this guy who uh, sexually harassed her, this nasty guy. I have a date. You are definitely executive material. I particularly loved crafting her character's background and putting her in situation after situation that was, that was sort of challenging and humiliating. I love the way she played that last scene in Chinese Box. Yeah! Yeah! You know, where she said, I thought revenge would feel good. 
I'm sure that he deserves whatever he gets, but it doesn't feel right. I just, I thought she was great. Pete found out you wouldn't want to end up like the tennis instructor. Lovers and madmen. Nora Grayson, played by Alison Hosick. She can do so much just by standing and looking at the guy, you know. It's just that for so long, I felt like I don't have anyone. And that was OK. As long as I stayed happy on the outside and dead on the inside. But then I met you. And all of a sudden, I feel things again. <laughs> and I need more. One of the best actresses out there. Just a terrific commitment to, to, to her performance. There's a lot of alpha males on this show. For some unique reason, nobody seemed to ever feel like their toes were stepped on, or if they did, nobody let it be known. Each one of them, Keith, Jack, Sherman, they were all just so fun to play off of. Harrison, could I have a touch more? This is awfully good. Keith Zerbaika, he's got that voice. We read a lot of guys for that part. And Keith really had this incredible um, ability to be strong without doing anything. And what Keith delivered was a guy who was just always simmering. There was a certain rage right under the surface. I really need to start carrying a gun. It sort of came out maybe as biting sarcasm, or it came out as like clipped authoritative dissatisfaction. After this comes out, I might still be able to get a job wearing a hairnet and saying, would you like fries with that? And that's what a great actor will do, is, is, is you sense something under the surface, but the actor's not showing it to you in every scene because you get tired of it. Jeff. Sherman Augustus came a little late to the party uh, because we were trying to add more foils to profit. We watched the pilot and we realized we were going to burn through a cast a lot on this show, unfortunately. Jack, how are you? Well, I'm good, Jim. I'm really good, but uh, you're not so good, are you? Scott Pollan, who was the president of Profit's division, caught on to Profit pretty early on. I know what you did to Gail. I know what you did to me. Gotcha. So I left the pilot thinking it would be really fun, like you think there's going to be this long arc between Prophet and his boss. Jack Walters, you are under arrest. And the second episode, he sends Paul into prison basically for 30 years, just out of the blue. We just realized we were in a real corner. And we had to create a character to kind of be the moral center of the show. I don't know what we would have done without you. Kind of the equal and opposite of Prophet. Yeah, that's why I need a friend. Here I thought it was my charming wit and winning smile. He had a whole relationship with Joanne. So he was like another wheel in this, but of course, Prophet ends up outsmarting him at every turn. I'll give you a ride back to the salt mines? That kind of role, again, it, like the Joanne role, I'll be in my car. if you don't have the right actor, it flatlines. Because being the good guy is not as much fun as being the bad guy. You don't get the flourishes. Um, what it requires is you bring a lot of yourself to it. You bring a lot of your own grace and dignity to, to, to the role, which is what I thought Sherman really brought to it. It's got to be 5 o'clock somewhere. Jack Gwaltney, who is spectacular, plays the kind of drunken uh, junior Grayson Pete. Jack's really good, and it was deceptively because he you really think, oh, I'm watching kind of a drunken wastrel. Iced tea? I wonder how long Pete's been sober. Oh, yeah. And wanting everyone to think that he's not. Probably should run it by my brother, Mr. Toadhead. No, I'm watching a really good actor. It was an adult comic book. That's what they set up. That's the way it was explained to me. I would probably amend that and say it's a graphic novel for adults. It certainly is not naturalistic at all, yet I wanted the show to feel natural. We had to play a very fine line, sort of tongue-in-cheek, but very realistic at the same time. You think that little trick you pulled at the hospital is going to fool anybody? I certainly hope so. Could this really happen? If the script said it did, it did. I think comic book is a good reference because it means sort of big graphic images, slightly larger than life. It's very theatrical. It sort of has this bigness and this darkness. It's a very designed show. The colors are very carefully selected. The shots are very composed. Everything flows the way you would imagine it would flow in a great production of an opera. As I think about it, Prophet would make a very good opera. I've been summoned. 
The conceit of the show was opening line and closing line of each show was him literally speaking them out, out loud, and then the rest you were always in his head. It was to put you in his point of view. Chronic impotence. That certainly can eat away at a man's self-confidence, especially with such an attractive wife. Sleep. The voiceover primarily goes back to the Richard III idea. I'll have her, but I will not keep her long. But though I killed her husband and her father. And it basically told you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You know, this is what this person wants, this is what that person wants. And then the difference between what he desires and what actually unfolds, I think, be actually becomes a source of suspense. Failure. It's a much better teacher than success. My failure was in underestimating my competition, which was far more complex and dangerous than I had suspected. I'll know better next time. You know, the voiceover is usually the last resort of the weak writer because you can get a lot of exposition in, in, in that way, and by God, we did. Frankly, a couple times saved our asses. Um, there was a line where some scene got cut that explained why in the pilot Prophet was trying to seduce Nora, the wife of Pete, by kind of keeping her at a distance. I can't see you anymore. And I remember David calling me and he said, we gotta, you know, have a voiceover to explain this because the audience is confused. So we batted back and forth, back and forth, a bunch of different versions that we sort of came up with. When you want someone to love you, open your heart. When you want someone obsessed with you, close it. When we screened it a couple times, people would laugh because there's a certain truth to the line, I think. It's psychotically enough, it's, I think it is true. Jack's my boss. Joanne is head of security. And they lied to all of us about where they were going. We wanted you to be with Prophet. I guess they just don't trust me. I wanted you to take his hand and go through the show with him. The fact that he let you in, the fact that you're his ally, the fact that he likes you. You know, you, the viewer, are his buddy. Everyone comes around. Then when he lies down in that box in the end, are you lying down in that box with him? Or are you horrified or preferably a little bit of both? The box is, is, a, is a, such an important uh, image in, in, in the show. Johnny had read about a serial killer who had been raised in a box. I think it might have been Whoever Fights Monsters by Robert K. Ressler, who was an FBI profiler. And he recounted one, a case history of a, of a child who had been literally like left in a box for its first two years with a TV, and the, the parent threw food in. We fell in love with this idea, and we said, well, okay, we need that guy who was raised in a box. What's on that box? What does that box mean? What's the, what's the implication for his life? In our fictional story in Prophet, it, it did a couple things. It, it made him independent. It made him, you know, very determined to never be put in a box again. And yet, every night, he sleeps in a box. You know, people remember the box. I mean, you take it literally or figuratively, it's, it's equally as interesting to me when you have a character who crawls up at the end of the day in, in a box. I think everybody sort of feels like they're in a box. I think everybody feels like if people only knew how brilliant and wonderful I really am, somehow they would treat me better. Maybe he's just a little bit more honest about it than, than the rest of us. But I think it was just as... Um, it made just as much sense as somebody going home to their apartment. Both David and I were a little unimpressed with a lot of TV because it seemed to be a foregone conclusion in most shows that the hero would win. Evening, Jim. I understand we have a little problem. This is a much more complex show than just a guy who's bad and who does bad things, and then he gets what he wants. David and John are well-read, highly intelligent people who know character, and they know how to tell a story. I didn't do it. A fella named Jeffrey Sykes did. He's a lawyer. He just came to work with us at G&G. &G. Take him somewhere and kill him. They were able to incorporate everybody's arcs into the storyline. And it didn't feel phony. It actually felt quite organic. Going back east to see Uncle Arthur. My uncle? The plots were hard. They were just pure hard work. Our lives are going to change for the better. Does, does Chaz know no. that? Nobody knows. We had plotted 
these huge story arcs involving the supporting characters. The dissolution of Chaz's marriage, the dissolution of Pete and Nora's marriage, and then Pete getting sober. I mean, these were all really carefully plotted out. And then you changed one little thing in episode one, and it affected five things in episodes three and six and seven. You know, the week-to-week -week structure of the show was, was really fun for us. It's a regular television show turned on its head. It's really structured, and it's structured like a thriller. When David and I were first pitching the show, we said, it's the fugitive, if the fugitive had killed his wife. It was really about a guy who, at every moment, is almost going to get caught doing something he shouldn't be doing. That gave the show a certain propulsion and energy, that it wasn't just a guy sitting in his office. I need to talk to you about the black box. Planning the takeover of a company. It was a guy who had a lot at stake, and a great number of people were on to him and were trying to outmaneuver him. I don't like coincidence, Jim, especially when they end up wrapped in neat little packages. And also it made our other characters smart, and that then made the game better and more fun. Jeff, if you stumble across some sort of evidence here, I'm sure you're going to do whatever your conscience tells you to do. And when I do, I get fired. Part of the appeal of the show and of the character in particular was the notion that there's a certain banality to evil. It is a moral quandary. The idea that evil can survive and flourish in a corporation is, I think, a funny idea and a real idea. They say goodness is its own reward. And if a good man perseveres, he can leave the world a better place than he found it. Certainly David and I spent a lot of time laughing as we would destroy people. We'd pretend to be Jim Prophet and just destroy these characters. And I have to say there was a lot of maniacal, you know, laughter about it. Technically, you know, it's a drama, but it's very much a comedy to me. And it's even very much a farce. If you look at it, there's a lot of people coming in and out of doors, and there's this sort of uh, Rube Goldberg mousetrap-like plots of this, you know, one domino knocks another domino knocks another domino. So it's very intricately plotted. Joanne, is that that new background check I asked for? Yes. I did call Chaz to make sure he authorized it. You're so creative with memos. Every time a script came along, I knew that there was going to be something stirring in it. I knew that there was going to be something really complex to make sense of. You couldn't have had two better people at the helm. Uh, they set the example of how things should be done, I think, and how things can be done seemingly effortlessly. But clearly, there's a lot of sweat and work behind it. I smell Bobby. Prophet pushed the envelope a lot for which you could show on network television. There's this real snotty sound you got in your voice, which made me just want to grab a belt, yank your britches down, and beat your ass to hamburger. So what do you say? We were going way beyond anything in that arena that had ever been done in television, I'm sure. For an example, my character would have an, an affair every show with someone new, sometimes two people, and always with Jim. I mean, every day it was like, can you believe we just did that? We'd get away with stuff that was phenomenal. They delighted in pushing the envelope. There's nothing quite like a caring mother. We pushed the envelope and tore it, you know. We definitely had our tangles with standards and practices at the time. What are you doing? Let go of my hands. Why? So I can get my pantyhose off. There was a particular incident involving Prophet having sex with a woman in an elevator. He then keeps her underwear in his pocket and takes it out and sniffs it in his office. They start the scene and put him in the drawer and put it, the sensors are gonna go nuts. And there's just no way you can show that on TV. And the intent was, I would of course cut that from the picture sniffing the underwear so that I could keep the sex scene in the elevator, which is a pretty raunchy sex scene for, the, for its day. And I remember my attitude with standards and practices was, I don't understand why you're so upset by this. This is, this is just a man smelling woman's underwear. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's very natural. You know, we're driven by our pheromones. I had this long, just ridiculous speech about, you know, 
animals know they love each other or care for each other by the scent. And, and this is a moment of, of, of insight. And, a, and it was a guy smelling underwear. That was fantastic because they focused all their energy and attention on that one part of that episode. And we were able to slip a couple other things through the cracks. And then she came along. Eleanor, my other yet my same. My fire, my ice. Gay love. Uh. You know, it used to be the love that dare not speak its name but couldn't stop singing about it on Broadway. But nowadays, you know, gay love, you know, gay, 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 gay. Nowadays, networks call you up and it's like, the ratings are down, do a lesbo episode. But back then, it was unheard of. You, you remind me of my best friend in high school. We used to have these great sleepovers. Well, this started a brouhaha like you cannot believe. Maybe I don't even need a man. Then the thing Fox did that really pissed me off was they called Glad to ask them what they thought of all of this. Come here. And they came back, the censors came back down saying, you know, you cannot show to kiss, but you cannot show a bad thing happening to anybody because they're gay. I never felt like this way. It is wonderful. And you can't show a good thing happening because you're... so they had this talk about a box, you know, they had this odd, half politically correct. So they're half afraid of you know the people on the right, and they're half afraid of people on the left, and it was ridiculous and had no place in there. So we had this kiss, and they decided that they would shoot it like we would come together very, very slowly. So if they had to fade out or you know cut, no, I can't. You could never really have them kiss, so they almost kiss a couple of times, which was great because it worked for the character because Bobby's leading her on, and then Bobby's saying, no, you're a married woman, I can't kiss you. It wasn't Ellen. It wasn't like this righteous, wonderful, shining moment. Constance, there's something I have to tell you. It was kind of dirty and kind of fun and kind of evil and, and, and wicked. When you went back to your husband, it really hurt. You met someone else. <laughs> <laughs> There was no love at Standards and Practices for us. <laughs> Why don't you go see your mother? Dave is a great director. He is really smart and patient. Um, I think those are the two qualities you really need most as a director. I love directing because writing is very lonely. But directing is like this. You get to talk to other humans. You get to go out there and be on the set with your actors. You get to see the thing come to life. And it's quite easy in a sense to direct something you've written easy in the sense that you just have an ear for if you know if something is right or wrong he directs the same way he writes with a real sense of meticulousness while never losing a sense of fun and play there's one point in chinese box where prophet is a very tight shot and he's sitting like this and we're going and i suddenly said oh stop there's something wrong with adrian he has a headache and adrian looks up he goes i'm acting <laughs> and i go oops uh, my, my bad Pete. With my wife? <laughs> if you look at the characters in Prophet, I think every single one of them put together would make a well-rounded person. But unfortunately, they were all individuals. The fact that everybody in the show, male and female, was um, capable of a certain strength and aggression is what made the show interesting for the audience and I think is what made the environment challenging for Jim Prophet. If anything, like the crap you poured on Lucinda ever happens to me and mine again. I will wipe the floor with you. I think all those characters share that central theme of being motivated by selfishness, instinct, and desire. And the inability to see the world except for in terms of how it affects them. I can't keep it down anymore, and Pete keeps talking about him and talking about him, and I, I, I just, I can't. He, he's... Who? Uncle Art. He manipulates by knowing that which you are ashamed of, that which you are trying to hide, that which you most desire but cannot, you know, speak of. I don't want you to tell me anything that's going to make you uncomfortable. No, I want to. He finds people's weaknesses and plays upon them because he's intelligent. He uses the least amount of effort because he uses as leverage, you know, his victim's weaknesses against them. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't tell you what department I used to work in, did I? Auditing. When he zeroes in on, on Gail Coner in the pilot and, and, and zeroes in on the one 
tiny, tiny thing she's doing that's wrong. A few hundred dollars a month to get your mother a better room is hardly a crime. That is probably the only thing that character ever did wrong in her whole life. I'm going to have to ask you for one small favor. And he just found it and exploited it and steered her with it. And he leads people down their own dark uh, uh, aisles or pathways. And there's only one thing left to do, and that's to forgive him. No. It's the only way through this nightmare. I don't know. You've been right about everything else. Nobody under his quote-unquote power will do anything they wouldn't normally do. I could never face him alone. I'd never dream of letting you do it alone. He was a mirror to people's worst inclinations. Forgiveness is the best episode for me. David and I strongly suspected it would be the last episode ever. It's one of the few episodes of the show that I think really is emotional. You OK? No. Had Profit been picked up for a second season, we would have used forgiveness as a kind of a model for what you could do every week. That you could have a show that was really emotional and really scary at the same time. Norris Ted Kennedy-like uncle. This was a great, uh, great character. One of my favorites. I happened to write this show. Aren't you hot in that coat? He's an absolute monster. I think he's worse than Prophet in every way because his appetite is so unbounded. You were the cutest little girl. You remember the summer at my ranch? He's a guy who indulges all of his, uh, you know, perversions, including uh, raping little girls. Hey, Sheriff! Come out from your ivory tower and greet the peons. This guy comes to town. He has designs on taking over Grayson and Grayson. <laughs> Prophet would like to get rid of him. But he uses um, Nora Grayson to do this. You tarnished something very special. He maneuvered her molester into her orbit. You loved me, you know you did. And then created a scenario whereby she could choose would this man live or die? Strawberries is a murder weapon. This really comes from the heart, or what passes is my heart, the little black new walnut in there. If you're allergic, your throat closes up in about 15 minutes and you die. And there's just a, just a horrible, slightly terrific scene, but a horrible scene where she confronts him and he's not sorry about what he did. He thinks it's great what he did. I was 12 years old! Please, keep your voice down. Please, please. Oh, God, why did they have to grow up? He's having an allergic reaction. Please, hurry. The prophet leaves it up to her to decide. You make the call. And she lets this guy die right there in front of her. Nora. And the show's called Forgiveness. And the show's all about forgiveness and letting go and how you have to forgive people. <laughs> We wanted this last episode, Forgiveness, to give the audience a feeling that Prophet has arrived at a plateau. Family. It's everything. Prophet believes in family. Family, corporation, America all mean the same thing to him, by the way. To the family, to the company, and to Jim. By the end of this episode, he's made himself an integral part of this family. And that was his real desire. He wanted to be part of a family, you know? And he wanted to be loved. Drink up, everybody. Dinner's in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. We had one kiss that was supposed to be played for real. This was a kiss where both people were genuinely affectionate. Love me. He doesn't have anybody but her. I'm his family. When that camera pulls out and he's having sex with his mom, in the next room, the family is, you know, whatever, and you're pulling back, that to me is, is the real summing up of the show. I just, I love that last shot. I just think it's terrific. We shot the six episodes. I think one of the shortest orders in TV history. 
Most studios today wouldn't accept that, by the way. That was a huge financial loss for Steve because he couldn't sell the foreign. You know, nowadays you need a minimum of 12 episodes guaranteed to sell the foreign as a package. So I, I, God knows how much money Steven lost on the show. I don't want to think about it. And the critical response to the show was, was as strong as anything I've ever had. I had felt we had such a good, strong show, and I think everybody involved did too, that we just felt invincible. If I had sat down to write the reviews for my own show, I couldn't have been more glowing. I mean, they were saying that this is one of the three or four best shows ever in television. New York Times and Entertainment Weekly, and I mean, these incredibly erudite reviewers that we never thought would like or understand the show just, you know, raved. Time Magazine named it one of the 10 best shows of the year. I mean, it was, it was, we were like, oh my God, we're, you know, go pick out the Malibu house and get the Bentley. And then the ratings came in. <clears throat> and we had, you know, we had tune out. I mean, literally, half hour to half hour to half hour tune out. 8 million people at 8 o'clock, 6 million people at 8.15, 5 million people at 8.30. I mean, by the time we got to 9.30 and we we're sort of, Prof was about to kill his dad, I swear to God, only people that I'm related to were watching the show. I was on a first-name basis with the entire audience at that point. The ratings weren't where they were supposed to be. Uh, nobody wanted to nurture it and give it a, a chance to grow. Fox just chickened out, you know? They saw those early ratings. The second show didn't do any better. The third one was, was, was also you know, week and they and they just axed it. You get your reviews in a package from and, and they I got my package and it was a big package. And the same day I was also told they'd pulled the plug. This one's gonna say on my tombstone, brilliant but cancelled. The series cancellation was insanely painful as it happened I think right around my birthday. To this day I'm angry that uh, that show didn't get a chance. What it felt like was just it was just like a, a death, honestly, you know, because canceled is canceled. But our hearts and souls were really in this show. It was original, it was fresh. And when it was canceled, it really hurt, you know. It was really like, I loved that girl. I wasn't just dating that girl, I loved that girl. I think both of us wished that Fox had shown more patience because there was no denying the fact that the show um, was a ratings disaster. But there was evident proof that quality shows that stayed on the air, that had the support of critics, um, you know, eventually found an audience big enough to sustain. Testicularly speaking, Fox dropped the ball on this one, I think. Had anybody uh, had the courage to stay with it, um, you know, I think it would have been a, a big hit for them. Who are you? This is Jim Prophet Chez, new junior VP, taking over for Wayne. First day? Yes, sir. Well, Jim, you know what that makes you? The only person in this room that I can trust. One of the funny, ironic, and possibly sad things in the business is, after Profit, everybody in the business wanted to be in business with Johnny and, and me, and we both went off our separate ways and both did very well and made a lot of money and did things. But what they say is, oh, we want the guy who did Profit, but for God's sake, don't do Profit for us. There was really nothing like it on television, and there was, it, therefore it was hard for Network to evaluate, and it was probably hard for a lot of the viewing audience to evaluate, because you're looking at it and going, wait a minute, wait a minute, who do I root for? Do you think I'm evil? None of us are saints. I think it was about four or five years ahead of its time. I think it should have been on cable, should have been on FX, but there was no FX. This was pre-Sopranos, really pre-HBO. There was no FX, there was no USA, there was no Showtime to speak of in terms of, of original scripted drama. There was no HBO. So you had four choices, and certainly ABC, NBC, and CBS didn't come along and say, you know what, we're, we're going to put that on. We're going to put it on right after Murder, She Wrote. It's going to be awesome. You like TV. What? TV. Television. Me, personally, I don't. But I do agree there are times when it can be awfully educational. The show didn't work from a rating standpoint, but on a creative level, it was everything that we could have prayed for it to be. I consider Profit a steaming success. I absolutely, uh, on so many levels. I think creatively, artistically. You realize he's insane. He doesn't give a damn whether we make money or we lose money. I think we all knew none of us were in this for the dough. Something like this happens again. You'll be looking for employment elsewhere. Adrian, Rob, me, none of us thought the show was really going to be this huge breakout hit. We just knew we had to do it. It was some weird, it was like fish swimming upstream. I can't explain it. We just had to do it, and none of us would give up or let go. There's a thing in our business, sometimes a noble failure is better than a, than a long-running success. Certainly not from a financial or career point of view, but from the point of view of, you know, there's still a big feeling of what could have been. So, 
What do you want now? What you've always wanted. Ever since you were a little child in that box. More. And I love how, even after all these years, people on the street and people in the business still talk about it, kind of sorrowfully, fondly. Guard your morals, Mr. Sykes. They tend to disappear around here pretty fast. The show is about a lot of issues that don't go away. You know, family, success, failure, desire for success, fear of failure. We had a wonderful crew, you know. A uh, really uh, great uh, group of people. It was one of those dream jobs uh, that I haven't had since. The fact that it got made is a miracle. The fact that there's nine hours of it is a miracle. And we had so much fun. To this day, I still believe that if anybody would put that on and do it for a year, that it would, um, it would redefine the face of television. Profit was an experiment in going beyond what's traditionally expected from a television show. And recognizing that that's not always going to be accepted. But uh, it furthers your boundaries and your insight into who you are, into the world you live in. Shows are a real delicate mix of writing, acting, directing. It's got to be on the right network. It's got to be the right studio. It's got to be on the right night. It's got to get decent reviews. You know, it's got to have a lot of things going for it to sort of fit and be right. And this had everything except Americans watching. We must welcome adversity and embrace struggle. And no matter what we get from life, never give less than 100%. Of course, at the end of every battle-weary day, we fold ourselves into peaceful darkness and find comfort in those gentle words. Good night. Part of the blessing and the curse was that it was ahead of its time.